Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome back to another Keystone Dental Group Vanguard webinar. My name is Michael Martinek, Director of Marketing for Keystone Dental, and we believe that training and education is the foundation in the success and growth of you as a clinician. And we hope our Vanguard webinars, with the relevant and cutting edge topics shared by our world-class educators over these past few months, has helped you in your pursuit of ongoing learning. Today's webinar is no different. The title, One Surgery, One Time for Anterior to Molar Immediate Extraction Sockets. Today's presenter, I'm sure, does not need an introduction. He's one of the most well-known clinician, researcher, and educator of our time. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Dennis Tarnow. Dr. Tarnow is a graduate of New York University College of Dentistry and holds a certificate in both periodontics and prosthodontics. Dr. Tarnow is a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology. He has published over 240 scientific papers on perio, prosthodontics, and implant dentistry, and has co-authored four textbooks, including one titled The Single Tooth Implant. Dr. Tarnow has lectured extensively in the United States and internationally in over 45 countries. Dr. Tarnow has received many awards over his long and distinguished career, including the Master Clinician Award from the American Academy of Periodontology, Teacher of the Year Award from New York University, Distinguished Lecturer Award from the American College of Prosthodontics, and most recently, the American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019. Dr. Tarnow is currently Clinical Professor of Periodontology and Director of Implant Education at Columbia School of Dental Medicine. He is a former professor and chairman of the Department of Periodontology and Implant Dentistry at New York University College of Dentistry. Dr. Tarna has a private practice in New York City and has been honored with a wing named after him at New York University College of Dentistry. And with this, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Dennis Tarnow. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming on board. I want to thank Keystone and uh, for putting this together. It's always nice to have a company that's uh, interested in continuing education of their uh, people. And so I'm really proud to be uh, presenting today. The topic is a very current one and will be so for quite a while. It's called One Surgery, One Time, Managing Extraction Sockets in the Aesthetic Zone, but I've also added molars to this as well. But I want the concept of One Surgery, One Time to be the key focus point to save you time, money, uh, and let your patients be more comfortable with even a better outcome than delayed treatment in many cases. I want to give thanks to my partners, a specialized group of dentistry of New York, uh, great clinicians. All the cases I'm showing you today were done by myself with one of my partners. Um, so many of you might know Dr. Chu, uh, Dr. Smith, who's presented quite a bit, uh, Dr. Zamzak, Dr. Senecaro, uh, uh, Marion Brown, uh, um, Mark Hockman, and Paul Fletcher. So I want to thank them. They're a great group of uh, people. They're good friends and great clinicians. I want to give them credit for the great cases you're seeing today with me. And Adam is the is the master ceramist in our office. <clears throat> we have nine technicians, but he's the master ceramist. And the beautiful work that you'll see today was done uh, mostly by Adam. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Chu and I published this book recently by Quint on quintessence. You can go to quintpub.com. Most of what you see here and more will be in there with uh, about anteriors and molars are included as well. Uh, so you feel free to pick that up. I think it'd be a great reference text for you. Uh, it's got great diagrams and uh, I think a lot of great clinical cases, more, even more than you'll see today. So we know that we have situations we you know with type one with the buckle plates intact. Now, everybody has a different definition. And by the way, we'll have questions and answers at the end. So please, you know, list the question on the Q&A, uh, list the question and answers, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to stop and have uh, time afterwards for questions. So type one situation, everything's intact. You take the tooth out, the buckle plate's there, and, and everything looks perfect. Type two looks like a type one before you take the tooth out, but part of the buckle plate's missing. When at least five millimeters of tissue is a bone is missing, but the tissue is there, I call that a type two. The type three is, is where the buccal tissue is receded. And most people don't get into trouble in immediates in the front of the mouth. With this, they know they have to build this area up because the bone and the soft tissue are missing. So I want to focus particularly on type one today, 
where the buccal plate is present. Type 2 and type 3 are listed in the book. We can go over them. But type 1 is the critical piece of when we do immediates. When the buccal plate's there, we 90 plus percent of the time, with few exceptions, we do the immediates today. Uh, there are some oddball cases where we can't do it, but that's rare today. And even the molars, it's just going to change the way you practice if you're not putting immediate implants into molars. Our, our, our lecture today will hopefully change the way you practice and expedite your treatment for patients. The first thing is we do flapless surgery. We do not open flaps to take any teeth out unless they're impacted, period. I have not opened a flap to take a tooth out other than an impaction for, since the year 2000. That's how committed I am to this. It needs different techniques, it needs different pieces, but this is what you should be doing. The reason is that you obviously have taken away the periodontal ligament when you take out the tooth. And that's a major source of blood supply to that little piece of bone, that buccal plate. Now the marrow is your second blood supply, but there's almost no marrow, it's only cortical bone. As you see, it's so thin, as you know, it's so thin in here that it really has no marrow whatsoever, it's just cortical bone. And that's why it's so susceptible to resorption. The powder bone is what we're gonna use for our implants up in here and down in here. And that powder bone has marrow because it's usually thick. And the periosteum is the last piece of blood supply that's of any significance. And that's the tissue on the outside covering that, that buccal plate. And that's the critical piece. We do not want to interrupt that blood supply. Well, people say, well, I opened the flap, but I put it right back. And I'm a great surgeon. I put it right back. I don't care how good a surgeon you are. You open the flap, you've interrupted that blood supply. So that's a problem. So how thick is your buccal plate is the question. If it's, you know, the, the thinness of this is, is, is the thinness of this on the buckle is part of the problem, as I mentioned, and there's very little cortical bone. Well, how thick is your buckle plate? That's all, you know, it sounds like a funny question. How thick is your buckle plate? Well, the reality is, we go back to Mariano Sanz and others, you'll notice that the, they opened the flaps, unfortunately, but they did measurements. And one millimeter up from the buckle crest in the anterior part of the mouth, 64%, two thirds of all the six anterior teeth had only a half a millimeter thickness. Look at that. Another 23% was one millimeter. So listen, 90% of our buckle plates, this is not animals, this is humans. Uh, so 90% are one millimeter and most of them are half a millimeter. So we have to assume that all buckle plates are thin except for a small percentage. Uh, and only 10% only, only were greater than one millimeter in the six anterior teeth. Wow. So we assume that they're all thin, but does that mean that they're gonna change? Yes, but we can we can work today as you're gonna see with what we what we do. And now if you take a look at this, this classic article. This is why I stayed away from immediates years ago. Look at the dates, 1997, 98, 2000. There are a lot of others since then, of course. There are probably dozens now. But these were the articles that turned me away from doing immediates. Why? Because you see the healing time at six months, you had the vertical height, wasn't bad. Only about a millimeter change that you can live with on a ridge. But look at this buccal dimension, if you take out a tooth. And just look at that, wow. If you look up Lekovic study, that's with anterior teeth by opening a flap and putting it back and six months later going back in, he saw four millimeters of buccal lingual change with re-entries. That is amazingly, amazing number. Now, I just never see that when I have a buccal plate. And I wondered why. And there were people doing immediates before we were. We've been doing it for about nine or 10 years now. But the people doing it before us to say we didn't see this kind of problem. I was trying to figure out why. So I went back to literature like this. And what did they all do? They open flaps. And that's the key. So what do we have with, if you don't open a flap? And it wasn't until Uli Grunder, look at how late this is, 2011. It was the first article I could find where the buccal lingual dimension was discussed without opening a flap. Putting an implant into the palate towards the cingulum and no gap, this was with no gap. I mean, no, no, uh, no graft and no temporary, just the healing abutment. And what did Uli show? Uli, a good friend of mine, showed one millimeter change, not four, not these four millimeter buccal lingual changes. So this was a real major breakthrough in our thinking. Now, was it duplicatable? Was it, du was it possibly duplicate? And the answer is yes. Uh, Lyndon Cooper, Baron Cooper, Brownfield, Michael Daggetti, Ernesto Lee and, and Fiolini and ourselves, which we'll show you in a minute. We got to an average about a millimeter. Now a millimeter, you can't hardly see. A millimeter is one mark on that periodontal probe and that is hardly visible whatsoever. So to the naked eye, when you get to one and a half to two, you can start to see it. But one millimeter, you can't even see it. You can't even see it with your naked eye. You gotta measure it. So that's really good news. So one millimeter. We'll come back to that number, one millimeter with nothing in the gap, no temporary, nothing. 
and see what happens. So post-extraction sockets have been done. Peter Worley started it, uh, you know, with immediate placement, um, you know, with a temporary. Joe Kahn's done so much work, Mike Block, and so many others now as well. So the preservation minimally invasive therapy is the name of the game. Do not disturb if it's there. Minimally invasive is always what people do today. One surgery, one time. Now you look at the implant survival immediate sockets versus delayed by Cousins work in 2019. You see the literature review and immediates had a very solid percentage of success. And of course, these delays had a high percentage also, 98% on Cooper, but take a look, they're all 95% to 100%. And that's more than, more than what we normally expect. And this is the high numbers in delayed. Normally it would be even a little bit less, almost nobody has 100% success. But we're in the 95 to 98 to 100% success rate. And that's what we've seen in our office, 97% in ours. So take a look at a patient, take a look at Vanessa. Now she's got thin scallop tissue. Years ago, we would never touch her with an immediate. We'd be worried about recession, but she's got a problem. You say, well, what's wrong with the tooth? It's perfect. The problem is you got a big palatal abscess over here and she has this huge resorption lesion inside. Now you see the problem. So we have a situation that we can do the endo on it, but there's really not worth anything left on the tooth in order to save it. So we're gonna take that out and put an implant in. So here you see the thin tissue, it's thin scallop. The first thing we do is sharp the section as you see here, look how cleanly that's taken out. Minimal, you don't, don't use a periosteal elevator. You do a sharp dissection of the supercrestal fibers, then you take the tooth, and this one's easy to get out because it's still intact, didn't break, rotate it and pulled it out. And notice the nice intact tissue. The pillar is basically intact, so is the tissue. Place the implant to the palate. And what do we do to drilling? On the drilling, we start out breaking through somewhere about two thirds up the root on the first picture on the left. Make it go through a sharp. That's the only burr that sometimes is angled out to the front. After that, all the drills, every company has a two millimeter twist drill, 1.8 to 2.2. And that's where you aim at the cingulum and come right out the, this, this palatal bone and apical bone. So we're going to engage this palatal and apical bone to give us stability. And here you see the widening of the implant, widening of the, of the opening, and we might make a smaller opening, always drill at full length. You might go a little narrower, depends on the size and shape of the implant. And we use, as you'll see, aggressive thread implants, uh, similar to what Keystone has. We, we have Genesis and others that you'll see they have aggressive threads and tapered. And that's what we want to use. And when you place it, what you see here is that how high up do you place it three dimensionally? The region of a margin would be around here, but take a look at the bone. If you place it at the buccal crest, that's about three millimeters up from the free gingiva, three to four millimeters. And that's where we place the top of our implant, whatever implant you use. Now that's going to be, there's a scallop of bone in like a central incisor in the front of the mouth. And the scallop is normally between the buccal crest of bone and the interproximal is three millimeters. And there's another four millimeters, four and a half millimeters of soft tissue here. So if you place an implant correctly for aesthetic reasons at the head of the mid buccal bone, you're about seven to eight millimeters from the papilla height. That's why cemental restorations are so difficult to get the cement off and why we try to go to screw down wherever possible. Now you're going to make a temporary, you're going to make a shell, and then you do a reline. Uh, Dr. Chu came out with this uh, eye shell, which can be used as a support to reline it, and a, and a post. You put the post in, then you hold it in place, keep the tissue out, rebuild the area, as you, as you know, put this in here, rebuild this area, then overbuild it outside the mouth, smooth it out. You know where the top of the implant is, that's where the, the, the top is attached. You know where the incisor ledge is from your shell. And now you can you connect it to two and all these undercuts and so on, you fill them up without blood, rinse it off outside the mouth, and then you make a nice smooth profile. And you can clean it, make sure it's steam cleaned or at least use some alcohol and then rinse it down. Make sure there's no pumice or any kind of a, a polish on there. We don't want anything on the acrylic uh, that might interfere with the soft tissue adhering. This is before we stained it. So you see, we tried it in, it is out of occlusion. That's very important to get it out of occlusion, no protrusive and no central contact. And we tell the patient to stay away from biting into anything hard for the next two months on that tooth. That's the price of not having a flipper or an Essex retainer. So, uh, or bond the bridge. So there's the implant in, put it, put it on a straight post. Now we're gonna put some uh, graft material in here. We do cortical cancellus, or, or usually now we just do more cancellus bone right in here and we pack it. Pack it in with some firm package. There's the bone graft. We let it congeal. 
then we take off that straight post. There's the graft in place. We call this dual zone soccer grafting. I came up with that term because of the fact that we have a situation that we're grafting not just to the crest, not just to the crest of bone, but also to the um, not just to the crest of bone, but also to the height of the soft tissue. So we call it dual zone, bone zone and soft tissue zone. And that's what we do. That's going to, as you see, thicken the tissue. But here's the temporary stained, custom stained. Now this is socket seal surgery. We can see the temporary seals off the socket, and that's the key. Paul Weigel coined that term. It's a great term, prosthetic socket seal. So it contains the graft. The excess graft material gets pushed out by the temporary. It's all done. We push it out. And here's what it looks like in two weeks. It's as if there's no change at all. And that's what we see. The patient had no swelling. This is one of the best practice builders. What I'm showing you today are great practice builders. Patients love it. They go for lunch the next day. The patient, you know, was having lunch with their friend and say, well, didn't you have an implant yesterday? Didn't you have to lose your front tooth? And the reality is that the, the reality is that you have a situation where the patient is this one he said, really? Who's your dentist? Give me that name. I'm going to him or her too. Because this is what this is one of the best practice builders that we've seen over the years. And look at the contour. It's only two weeks. And there's the implant. There's the there's the uh, first disconnection to four months. Now we give it minimum of three or usually four months to let the tissue mature. And as you see, we take it out as if we did nothing. Look at that. And what you'll see is this. You'll see a little sometimes remnants of the bone graft up in here. Uh, you notice a nice healing in here. Notice the shape is not collapsed. You don't see four millimeters of shape of change because it doesn't happen. <clears throat> and we also see bleeding. Now we, when we see bleeding, that's a good sign. When we first take our temporary off for the first time, that means that the soft tissue has adhered right to the acrylic. Yes, soft tissue with an ep junctional epithelium can adhere right to acrylic. That's been shown by Verhog in the 50s, Hodish in the 60s and 70s. I mean, this is a well-established point. So epithelium can adhere to any clean surface, including, including acrylic, not just titanium or zirconium. It can adhere to any clean surface. Then we take impression, customize the impression with a little GC pattern resin. They pick it up, use some G-mask material for your laboratory, pours it up with some G-mask so they can take it on and off to make sure the fit is correct. And then here Adam's doing his uh, custom staining. And this one was cementable, although today we do screw downs, but this one was cemented. And here's the final crown in place. And here it is three years later. You can see the beautiful tissue height and the contour. That's what we tend to look for. Now we published this in, a, in compendium, uh, in this concept of a dual zone, uh, 2012. We did it with the bone graft right to the height of tissue. So we didn't just graft to the crest, we're doing it to thicken the tissue. And as you'll see, this is rather consistent for us. And this allows us not to have to use a connective tissue graft. This obviates for us the need for doing a connective tissue graft. If the buckle plate's there, we don't put any connective tissue grafts in, no, nothing except the bone graft all the way to the top, and that thickens the tissue, as you'll see in a moment. There it is. <clears throat> so we published this classic article. I think it's classic because we did four different procedures and documented. It's a multi-center study. I want to give credit to Dr. Garber, Salama, Henry, and Maurice, and the Santa Caros from Argentina and our, our group in New York. And uh, we did a four different things. And what did we do? We did a bone graft. We did no bone graft, no bone, no BG, no bone graft, no provisional. In other words, just a healing above. Now remember, that's what Uli Grunde did. And what was his change in the soft tissue at the height of the implant? One millimeter, 1 1.0. We'll come back to that. The second group was a provisional, no graft. Third group did a bone graft with just a healing abutment. And the fourth group, everything combined. Bone graft, like I showed you in this last case, bone graft and the provisional holding everything in and, and, and holding the tissue out. So let's see how the buccal lingual dimension looks. We measured the buccal lingual dimension change on these teeth. And what, so this is not the bone, it's just the whole dimension of the soft tissue and the bone together. So let's take a look. We measured it one millimeter up, two, three. Three is about where the implant was, the top of the implant, five, seven, and nine. So we went right up the whole side of the buccal lingually. We measured the dimension. The first group, no bone graft, just the healing above it. Now look at the three millimeters up. This is what Uli Grunder measured. Look at this. He had 1.0. What do we have? 1.1. Wow. This was great news. This shows us that what we have here 
is a situation where we expect about a millimeter of change without a flap, and that's the key, no flap. And that's the change that we see, one millimeter is about what we expect. Now, if we put a bone graft in, in other temporary areas, what happens? If we did a temporary, that tends to hold the tissue out, as you see here, that's good. Okay, a little bit less change, that's 0.7, that's seven millimeters, that's 0 0.7. Put a graft in, bone graft, a little bit less. And we put the graft and the provisional group four, look at this, a tenth of a millimeter, the average. So in other words, this keeps the tissue out and prevents us from uh, collapsing in to the point where, like I just showed you, even on that thin scallop case, it shows you that what we have there works out quite well. And we have a situation which is very viable for us to feel comfortable with. So the key is the, the buckle plates there, put the implant in towards the palate, Put it up about three to four millimeters from the buccal zenith point, buccal height of tissue, which is about a millimeter at the crest or a millimeter apical to it, and then uh, temporize with the dual zone socket management. And we've been doing this for about seven, eight years now with incredible success. Do it routinely, still today. And the aesthetics, what about soft tissue changes, buccal to lingual? And what you see here, we measured the gingival third of the free gingiva on our cast. We measured the middle third and we measure the incisal third. And what do we come up with? We see that in the first group, bone graft and no bone graft, no provisional, the buccal lingual thickness right at the gingival third, right above the implant was 2.3 millimeters. Middle third, 1.8, incisal, 1.2. And if you, did the, if you did the provisional, kind of give a little bit extra thickness here, okay? The incisal third at the, is always a little bit thinner, but here's the key, right, at, right at where the implant is, was 2.8. Did the bone graft? About the same. But look what happens when we do both. Oh, yeah. This is great. Look what we happens. 3.1 versus 2.3 with no graft, no temporary. With the graft and the temporary, 3.1. This is equivalent to what people have registered with the, with the connective tissue graft, making an extra surgical procedure. We don't do that because we don't find the need for it. Not, a, I'm, not that I'm adverse to doing connective tissue grafts. I do them all the time. But this is, uh, and I showed you that last time in our lectures, if you were there together, I had to fix problems. But this is a this is a nice way to keep it simple and clean and look at the extra thickness. Now, what's this green line across here? This green line is uh, is two millimeters. Now, why do we look at two millimeters? Ronald Jung and Van Brackel also showed that if the tissue is thicker than two millimeters, then what happens is you don't see the metal coming through and it minimizes it. So this is good. So wherever we can, we want to get this on there to be able to, you know, um, get this on there, uh, get this thickened so that we don't see the tissue coming through. That's the winner. That's where we do the temporary and the bone graft together. That's the winner. And take a look at Jay. Now let's take, take a look at one of the Keystone products. This is Genesis. We did a whole study, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, Jay has to lose this left central. As you see why, similar thing, big internal resorption. Look at this big infection on the palate. Okay, we're gonna have to take this out. See the big disease area, we're gonna take it out. We're gonna place the implant. I had to clean up that palate. We had that big infection, so I cleaned that up. But notice this is intact, the buccal plate's intact. That's good, the lesion was pallid. I'm gonna now place the implant. Now this is the Genesis implant, it's got a pink top. Now, uh, Dorit Bittner and ourselves at Columbia, along with the Shigemi up in uh, Harvard, did a joint, uh, a joint uh, research. We thank Keystone for helping support that. It was a it was a switchover study where Genesis implants were placed and pink and and gray abutments were used on the same patients and measured the tissue change color wise spelled with a spectral photometer, not by eye, by a machine. And we showed that the pink top and the pink implant, particularly the pink abutment, was the critical piece to to making the best aesthetics. So you can I think Nareed presented to you already. That's good, but I want to emphasize you did a great job, Nareet Pittner, and this is what we do. So you put it, notice the aggressive threads, you have great binding of this, tapered, exactly what I showed you before. Place the implant in, as you see here, to the palate, the cingulum, put the, put the, put the post on, make, the, make it, reline the temporary. There it is coming out the cingulum, which will be a screw down, as you see here. Place a bone graft in, as you see, in this case, some band blast. Keystone, so we wind up placing the graft in, and here we see the, the temporary put on. Notice he has a big space here to begin with. <clears throat> Eventually, Dr. Chu is going to do some uh, bonding there. There's the implant in, it's going to be filled up. There's, there's a size and shape. This, this is one week later. Notice the palate, of course, is still healing where he had that big abscess. 
Now you see you had the space here, and now the patient trusts us. It's out of occlusion. The patient's still watching it. Make sure that they don't eat on anything too hard. Here it is in three weeks, and you see that the now you can see that they're starting to heal nicely. The tissue looks very nice. Notice the color looks good. <clears throat> and then he let us he let he let Steve do some bonding and change the contour on the temporary at this point. So we got rid of this. So we got rid of this uh, big black space that he came in with. A big triangle. So we had a, let's just change the contour. Here's the contour change. Nice, very good. Cosmetically, it looks very nice. Then we take the, take this out and we're gonna make an impression. Now notice the bleeding. This is what we want to see. The bleeding is there. That shows that the tissue adhered to it, and we get our best results, meaning the tissue adhered to a more coronal position. And this is what we like to see when we take off of the healing abutment for the first time. And that's the epithelium um, that's attached to it. Now, of course, that epithelium will eventually migrate down to the top of the implant, but at least initially, the soft tissue heals in a more uh, coronal position and seems to give us our best thickness when we have that. Impression, custom impression, blue GC pattern resin around the impression coping. <clears throat> there's the pickup, and there's the final crown on the model. This, we gold plate this, so you have that there, gold plate it. And here you have the final crown in place. And this is the Genesis implant <clears throat> with the screw down final case in place. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think you see the beautiful result we get. Excuse me. Great stability. And this works quite well. This is the before and the after. So it shows you how well cases work and how we handle them. <clears throat> Now we did a multi-center study um, for, for Keystone with the pink top and the Genesis implant with uh, the pink abutments. It's a five-year survival study done in multiple, multiple private offices, seven centers within the United States, 120 subjects. It's a longitudinal study, 12 to 15 subjects per center, treatment for a single two or three unit bridges, immediate or residential sites. So these were real life situations in clinical practices. These are the doctors that participated, excellent clinicians from around the world, around the, around the country, uh, very proud of the group, and they all contributed to the cases study. <clears throat> study objectives, assess the five-year survival rate of the Genesis system, then safety, effectiveness, and so on to see how this works. Two-date summary, 168 plim implants placed in 120 patients, overall success rate, success rate 90 Five percent, point eight, almost ninety-six percent. Minimal recession was seen around the implants with tissue loss of less than a millimeter. In fifty percent of the sides, soft tissue had shown to increase actually in overall height. That's particularly in the papilla. Seventy-eight percent were in healed sides. Twenty-two were intermediate. So this was real life situations in terms of what the patients were receiving. Today, the grafted sites at were thirty-three percent. Sides not grafted on the buckle, sixty-six percent. Female to male, pretty typical, 60 to 40. Upper teeth, 51, is even between mandible and maxilla. Age range, normal range for a practice. So this is important. I just bring this up to show you that this Genesis implant, the multi-office trial study, 168 implants in 120 patients, seven private offices, in real life situation, survival rate, 95.8 survival. Lovely, lovely work. So, and, and now we have the aesthetic study I mentioned about from, with Nareed Pittner of Columbia with us, combined with um, Shigemi up in uh, in, in um, Harvard, showing that we have beautiful aesthetics, the best aesthetics were with the pink uh, abutment, and that really showed switching it over. So the pink abutment is the winner, um, and it was much better, of course, than the regular metal one, and we showed that with spectrophotometer on the same cases, switching either one back and forth. And you can look up Dr. Pittner's article. <clears throat> They also have different diameters. The nice part about Genesis, they also go wider, uh, but even if 6.5, as you'll see, sometimes that's not even enough, but you'll see both that in a minute, but even 6.5 sometimes isn't enough, and sometimes we have to go wider, and then we use the, the Keystone Max implant, and that will be, will be, uh, we have to use the side walls of a molar. I'll get to that in a few minutes. And it's got platform shift, variable platform shift. I love the fact that the, all the implants are platform shifted, even the narrow ones. But as you get wider, to get a big 6.5, you 
you have a one millimeter platform shift and that helps hold the bone. So no bleeding versus bleeding. What you see here is that when you have, remember I show you our best results with bleeding, so all different types of implants. And what you see here is that you go back to the original study, where vertical height was better, 2.7 millimeters vertical height on, from the top of the implant versus two. That's great. That means that the vertical height was actually held up and better and the gingival thickness at right at the three millimeters down about the top of the implant was also thicker than if we didn't have bleeding. So just having bleeding really helped give us a much better uh, cosmetic response. We published on this in 2015. Dr. Hanai Saito is the key author here. So one abutment one time is nice. You put the abutment in if you can do it. Uh, Marco Dugetti and others have done this in, uh, and uh, Salama, but the reality is that's not that's not usually possible. Sometimes we take the abutment on and off and, and check our tissue, scope the tissue, and so this is a problem. However, what we're really seeing is one clean abutment at the time of surgery, and one clean one clean abutment or one clean temporary, the first time may be equally valuable. Hold the tissue during the healing, and that seems to do the trick. And Linda Bloom, you talk about, what about periapical sites? Linda Bloom did a study uh, showing that immediate placement of implants into periapically infected sites, the retro, a prospective randomized study in 50 patients, there was no difference in survival. So people say, what happens if I have a periapical area? I put these two studies in, and there are others now too, that show that there's no problem. This is the Hamley group from Zurich by immediate prospective. These are prospective controlled clinical trials and this 2007, there was no difference in results. So immediates can be done with both of these. I think that's important, these kind of cases. So conclusions for primary sockets, dual zone therapy is what we like to do, flaplessly, graft the bone and the soft tissue together. Ridge collapse about two tenths to two, one tenths to two tenths of a millimeter when you do dual zone, but you can go up to one millimeter. It's not always 100%, the average is 0.1. Can you get about a millimeter? Sure, that can happen. But the reality check is that um, by doing the dual zone, it pushes the tissue out and makes it thicker. Half the cases are even a little wider than we started. So that's kind of good. Peri-implant soft tissue gain uh, without a connective tissue graft in thickness was 0.5 to 1 millimeter versus the pre-op. Okay, so that's, that's what the dual zone does. Mimic submergence contour of the extracted tooth with custom healing above it or provisional, ideally with the provisional, for graft containment and protection. We don't see dry sockets with this. It's kind of interesting. We do not see dry sockets with this. One clean abutment the first time may be more important than the number of disconnections. And the angle correction implants increase incidence of screw retained versus cement retained definitive restorations. So the key is to go to the cingulum right away, and that's the key. So when I disseminate type ones, immediate placement in the aesthetic zone, type one socket. Thick and flat, we used to always do that anyway. That was good. Thick, flat tissue, lots of bone, lots of tissue. Thin scallop, we now have included that. The answer is yes. We do this routinely now, media placement in the aesthetic zone, because now we see that that's even the best for thin scallop. It holds the tissue from collapsing. Putting the implant in, grafting and putting in a provisional actually is better than if we let everything collapse and then try to rebuild it, with, especially with thin scallop tissue. Type two, where the buckle plate's missing and high smile lines? No, we got to wait. Although we have pushed it in non-aesthetic zones with a membrane inside, that's not today's lecture, but we, we have done that. And uh, then you can do it, but only for low smile lines. We put a membrane in with a buckle plates missing and packed a graft against that. Dr. Santa Caro and ourselves published that. And again, that's in the textbook of the single tooth implant uh, that, we, that we published, Dr. Chu and I. Type three, no tissue, no bone. Obviously, do a delayed case no matter what. That's the summation of that so far. So we must think biologically, do not disturb the tissue, minimally invasive therapy. That's what it's all about. So we're gonna bring this biology, biology up a little bit more. One surgery, one time. So now let's get to real, some of the fun pieces here, where we start to open this up to other, other areas, where particularly not just the front aesthetic cases, but what about molars and so on. But let's talk about the, you to understand that, why we stayed away from molars for a long time, was one, there was no apical bone because of the nerve or the sinus. That was one problem to lock into. And the other problem was there was bigger gaps and we were worried about the gap distance. So let's talk about gap distance in all these cases. So you have, a, there's a lot of misconceptions about gap distance and whether or not it's important. So let's take a look at this.
<clears throat> so here you see a case with two lower end tears I did years ago. This one I did with Dr. Smith. You take a look at it. The gap is greater than people say, well, if the gap is greater than one and a half millimeters, you get a fiber seam. Is that true or not? Well, there's a reason why that that's a misnomer. That's incorrect. The gap distance, as you can just find out, does not matter as long as you do certain things. And I'll show you what that is. So we do these two implants. This is where we handle lower anteriors where the cuspids are not being crowned. Put two implants in and then temporize immediately. Now, this is why we didn't do immediates. The combination of the resorption that we talked about plus this. Now, the, the first group I told you the resorption was there because they opened the flap and they showed that resorption. I also now showed you that we don't see that kind of resorption if we don't open the flap. Now, <clears throat> take Carlson's work. Look how far back this goes. All different types of implants, all different types of surfaces, all different types of animals. Same thing. Every one of them shows that if the gap distance horizontally was greater than 1 to 1.5 millimeters, they got a fiber seam. And let's go back to some of the research. That's Akimoto and Becker, uh, 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 Carlson, uh, Warren and Godfredson, Knox Cordell and Meffert. These are great clinicians, great researchers, and they all show the same thing, no matter which implant they use. Okay, so what was the reason? Let's go to Akimoto and Becker's article. It was very well done, and I want to show you what they did. And they did like most of the others. They insulated the animal, waited for healing, and then created different gaps. No gap to control, half a millimeter gap here, one millimeter gap, 1.4 over here. And you can see the bottom diagram. They try to find the bone out before they place the implant into the apical bone. And so they had different size gaps. So the biggest one was 1.4, maybe one and a half. And what did, they, what did the healing look like? Well, let's look at the right screen. That's the control. The control is no, no gap. The red is bone. And take a look at the beautiful adaptation, of course, to the bone, to the implant. But let's take a look at the test. This was the 1.4 millimeter opening. So this is what put us off for a while. Because what you see here is that the implant integrated in the apex, well, what do you see here? That white is fibrous tissue, see? Right there where the gap was, that's right in here. That's this case right there, see? So why should we ever do an immediate if we're gonna get fibrous tissue between the implant and uh, where there's a gap? Well, I don't want fibrous tissue there because a little periodontal disease takes place, which can unzip. So this is one of the problems. Even if there's no pocket there, it can unzip if there gets if any periodontal inflammation, you know, down you go. You lose half the bone overnight. So <clears throat> we have a situation here that why should we do it? Well, I went back and looked at these study. I went back and looked at all these studies, this whole group. And what did I find? Well, they did something similar to this. And what did they do when they finished this case? They put the cover screws on and they pulled the flap over the top of the gaps. They pulled the flap back over the top of the primary closure. Now that's without, without a membrane. Now if they put a membrane in over here, over here, that would block the flap from getting down here. That would give bone, which is slower growing, bone the time to come across the gap. But because they just covered it with soft tissue and it has a pedicle graft with blood supply, that connective tissue came right down faster than this bone could come across. So the clot forms right away. And then this connective tissue from the flap comes right down here right down here, and then you wind up having a fiber seam. And that's why the, it's why you have this. But I didn't show you any flaps, did I? Here's the key. Let the, let the socket heal by secondary intention. And it changes the whole equation. Let's go back one. So gap distance of wound healing is great. This is that case I showed you, and it's filled in. Now, whether or not I did no grafting in here, that just filled in with a temporary O2 of Pontix, look at the beautiful response. Now, what's up against the implant? Is it bone? I did not pull a flap over the top. See, I left the gap healing by secondary intention. And therein lies the key. And there's the implants. Here's the, here's the final case in place. Dr. Smith did this case. So let's go through this discussion. Primary flap closure, because this is going to let us decide whether or not we're comfortable doing immediates in the front of the mouth, but particularly in molars, which is what we're going to get to. When you take a tooth out, you get a clot, obviously. Now, the clot always is described in the diagram as nice and beefy red, like this picture here. The reality, though, is nothing lot living in 10 minutes, the, everything in there is dead. All you got is dead red blood cells and fibrin. So what you have here is a situation where there is no blood vessels in here, even though it looks like it's full of life, it's really dead. Now, how does the socket heal? Epithelium normally heals at the rate in our body of, of one 
one, one half a millimeter to a millimeter per day from the from the wound edge. So if I get a scrape on my hand, I would about a 10 millimeter scrape. It would take about a millimeter from each side per day, about a week or so before the epithelium would uh, cover that that uh, that that wound. And what happens? The clot forms. Now here's the key: does the does the epithelium go over the clot? The clot protects the open the braided wound, or does it go under the clot? It can't go over the clot because it's not vascular. The clot is a scab. It's a vascular to get blood to get blood supply for mitosis. The prickle cell layer goes through mitosis, and what happens is you see that the, the it has to go under the under the the clot, that's why the edges come off. You know, you have to pick at the edges. Well, this is the key here. It tries to come across. Where's the, no, the epithelium, uh, let's say a 10 millimeter opening, heals much slower. As you all know, it takes longer than one week to heal, to get the first layer of epithelium on a socket. Well, like three weeks based on Amler's work in 1961 and 62, 60, 62. He showed in humans it takes about what? Three weeks before you get up on average before you get epithelialization it's delayed compared to skin why because of the depth of the socket and instead of it being shallow like on my skin here it now has a situation where it tries to go under the clot but the clot is deep you got and you got bone on the sides so you can't get down in here then there's new new vessels coming out of the bone new granulation tissue to block it so you see here's the key you got the clot forming from the, the clot is being replaced apically and from the walls with new granulation tissue. And what you see here is this can't go any further. It's retarded, it's slow. It cannot go any faster than what? Than these, than the, these new vessels coming out. That's gonna give it blood supply, but it can't go further across. That's why it delays. It can't, in the meantime, the clot is in there protecting everything. And I'll show you that clinically in a few minutes, but the clot is in there protecting whatever's in there, like a normal clot. And this epithelium is slow to grow over was the bone the granulation tissue coming out of bone is slow. And that's gonna take three to four weeks for it to fill over, get rid of the clot. And then once the granulation tissue with its new blood vessels come in, then this has the ability to maintain, keep, let the epithelium grow over it. And then it goes in like this, grows over and looks like this. So watch what happens. It comes across, comes out. The epithelium down here is retarded. It's gonna continue filling over, but this epithelium can't go down there because it doesn't have any ability to go by contact inhibition and new vessels coming out of the bone stop it. And eventually this fills in, as you see, <coughs> and then matures into bone. <coughs> nice. So it's a secondary wound healing. Now let's put an implant in. Same thing as a socket. Now you have a piece of metal, titanium in there it, does it change anything? Not really. Not if you don't pull the flap over the gap. You have the same gap there on the buckle, right in there. Now what happens is you don't pull the flap over because we never opened the flap. This is going to fill a clot and it's going to fill it and should do the same thing. And that's the key. So if this is true, gap distance doesn't matter. This is going to slow up. This comes across first to get to the implant, pre-coated to form bone. And so that's what we're seeing. This pre-coated to form bone, and then the epithelium will close up with it, but not faster. And then it turns into integration. Wow, this is what I've shown you. So we published one key article. It's a one case report, but it's a critical case report because it shows in humans. And this is Mr. Polongo, Mr. Anthony Polongo. And what you see here is a wide cuspid. It was part of a major case. It was a low lip line. Normally we make this into an ovate pontic, but we, it was part of a major rehabilitation. So we put another implant in. Look at the gap distance, four millimeters. It's twice the size of anybody, more than twice. Everybody said one and a half to two is the max to get bone up against an implant. This is four millimeters. Look at the size. And so we're going to look at this and we're going to let it heal. There's we put on a, just a healing abutment and the temporary was not on this at all. Just a, just a gap of the clot. And we let it heal. So the concept is, if we're correct, gap distance doesn't matter. So if you take a look at this real wide gap like this, what happens here? This will close over, it will close over, and this, this is delayed. This blood vessel is coming first, and that's what we want to see. Okay. And this is the healing. We made a temporary on it. After three, after three months, we took it off, made it temporary, and this is what we sculpted the tissue, and look what happened. No pocketing. 
Now the question is what's up against the implant. There was only a clot in there and a temporary was not even touching on this. It was, it was supported by the other implants. So what happened here? What happened to histology? So Steve to did this one with me. He called me and he said, Dan, look at Mr. Palongo. Take a look at the, the beautiful tissue. Remember the gap? I said, wow, sure, look at that. So we got this beautiful 4.2 4 millimeter gap and it's filled with something. Radiographically, what does it look like? This is what it looks like radiographically. It looks fine, everything's good. Look at the CAT scan on the right. This was 3.1 millimeters of bone. Now we don't know what's between that bone. That was That's the gap that was there. We just don't know what's up against the implant. That's the million dollar question. Do we have do we have connective tissue or do we have bone right up against the implant where we had that big gap? And so Steve said, boy, wouldn't it be great if we can, you know, take a look at it histologically. I said, well, we're, asking this, we're asking Anthony to donate his tooth and some bone. He said, well, maybe he'll do it for, for dentistry and for science. It was a very major decision. He had plenty of implants, so that was not the factor. And so I, he was kind enough, Mr. Belong was kind enough to say, okay, if it's that important, I'll volunteer it, I'll do it. And of course, we, uh, we, took, we took medical ethics less, lessons, we took legal lessons. This was not done lightly because uh, it was a perfectly healthy implant. But this was for science. This was his donation for science. And so I want to give him credit. Uh, I always joke around with about Tony. He said, he, you know, I said, Tony, we won't mention your name. It'll be confidential. And he's a nice little Italian guy. He's 75 years old. He says, hey, well, you mean you don't mention my name? You know, you mention my name. I give you a gift. You mention my name. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you truly appreciate what Mr. Anthony Polongo has given science. Let's take a look at what's up against the simplex. because we have this so well documented and we publish this. There's an, I rebuilt the bone and the implant, and here's the implant taken out. The right is the buckle, and the left is the palate. I did a thin, little thin removal. Let's look at the top of the implant. What you see here is the normal, beautiful tissue at the top. Now, this is an artifact that should that, that was probably for me sounding it. I should have done that, but look at the epithelium. This is the shoulder of the implant right up against beautiful epithelium, right up against the implant. This is after being loaded and in the mouth for nine months. So this is a beautiful thing. Beautiful. Let's go down a little bit. It was not a platform shifted implant. This one wasn't. There is the shoulder of the implant, beautiful, healthy, connective tissue. And on this particular implant, we'd expect the bone to be about the first thread. And there, ladies and gentlemen, is the first thread. And what you see here is the connective tissue. And here is beautiful bone right up to the top of the implant. Now, remember, there was a 4.2 millimeter gap here with only a clot, but no, no primary closure. It was secondary healing. And there's the proof of principle. It's only one case, but it's the proof of principle with more than, you can't say it was close to one and a half to two millimeters. It was four millimeters. That's what's so unique about this one particular case. And as far as studies go, you take all the animal research, it's the lowest part of our research. A case report is actually higher than the best animal research. Why? Because then you know it can happen in the human being. So, you know, this is, it's not perfect. It's not case controlled. It's not cohort studies, randomized control or systematic review. But look at this. The animal research is lower than any human case report well documented with histology. So we're right there. Now, what happens if you put a graft in? And this is the fun part. What if we put a graft in? What does the graft do? The graft helps keep the shape, but listen carefully. It helps keep, so there will be some changes in the bone from the injury of the extraction. But it, by putting the graft in, the shape of the ridge seems to be better and intact. In other words, the shape of the ridge seems to be, based on our research and others now too, prevent it from collapsing in. How nice is that? So we have a situation, we have a situation where we have a bone graft that really helps supporting it. But does it change the wound healing? Listen carefully. Does it change the wound healing? What's up against the implant? The answer is no. That is a misnomer. People say, oh, if you put that in, that'll block the, the, the epithelium, it'll block the connective. No, whatever would hit me with a clot, the same thing takes place. It may even take slower. It is there for shape, not to change what's up against the implant. Please remember that. It is not the same because when the new vessels come in, it's really just a clot. New vessels are going to come in from this wall here, and they're going to go right through the particles and, and until they get to the to the bone, until they get to the implant, and then to and integrate. So these are almost in the way of the new vessels, but nothing is going to change. It's not going to retard any epithelium, connective tissue from coming down. It means nothing. You could pack it in as hard as you like, if, even if you pack it in firmly and pack it as hard. You big, strong guys out there, you pack it in really hard. 
it won't matter if somebody packing in gently like this, same result. The key is the pepper, that's not going to do a thing because you know what? In the final case, listen carefully, in the final healing, and I very rarely say always or, or never, but in the final healing, the particles that you jammed up against that threads, like you see here, will not be up against the implant. They get pushed around when the vessels come into the clot, they get pushed out of the way, and the vessels then secure the position on the implant and create bone or connective tissue, in this case bone, and then the, the, the particles are still there, they're in the bone, but simply to increase the density and the thickness. And here's an example of that. Bergman and Lindy were the first ones to show something like that. This was BioS, and what you see is an implant here, and notice the particles placed right against the, the implant placed right against them, Notice that the particles, none of them are touching the implant. There's the implant, the black, and look at the pit blow up. The particles are not touching the implant. Not, there's the black is one of the threads, even though the implant was placed right to it. Wow, that's really critical. And we did a study, we just did one case report, Dr. Rosenlicht and I did one with an immediate sinus lift, where we had to take the implant out because she was getting messages from Mars. According to her, Joel did this uh, great oral surgeon in Connecticut. He did this implant in, and since he came to my office in New York, three about two and a half years later, he says, I'm getting, Dr. Rosnick won't take it out. He says, it's healthy. I said, it is healthy. It's perfect. She says, I've been getting messages from out of space. She said, if you don't take it out, Dr. Tano, I'm going to get somebody to do it. I want you to do it. So the good news is we at least got some histology on a two and a half year post-loading xenograph. So what you see, take a close look. This was placed by Joel simultaneously. The particles were right around the, right around the graft. It was, okay, and look what happened. The graft is still there. It's incorporated in the bone. These are the graft particles, the BIOS, uh, xenograft. What you see here is the new bone is red. This is a HA coated implant, and none of the implant, none of the, none of the surface of the implant is touching the graft, or none of the graft is touching the implant, even though it was there when it first started with the clot. So what we have here is a beautiful example of wound healing 101. So it's about the biology, and they're fine. They're not resolving, they're not going anywhere, they're not irritated, but that's the situation. And that brings us to the clinical piece of molars. I published this with Dr. Smith, uh, a whole classification of, of molar sockets, A, B, and C, and uh, this is now widely accepted. A, B, and C, the German, International Journal of Oil and Maxillofacial Implants. And what we did is we looked at type A, is where the implant in the molar is completely surrounded by the septum bone. The anchorage is in the bone, or the anchorage is from the septum, and the, and the septum is completely still there. We see this sometimes in maxillary first molars. And we, okay, there's no gap really except where the socket was because the bone is covering. This is an easy one to do, I mean, to think about and do. Lots of bone in the septum, and, we, and I'll show you that in a minute. And type B is the one we used to worry about. This whole concept of wound healing now changes everything because type B, you see, we have this big gap here. Wow. The stability is in the septum, but we have this gap. We'd always be worried about it. And we'd have to do all kinds of stuff. We don't want to do flaps. We take this out without a flap. And this works out really well now. But now we understand that it's okay. Excuse me, the gap distance does not matter. The type C is if the septum is gone, particularly in lower molars, you might see that. The septum gets wiped out or it's not there in second molar sometimes, we just put a wider implant in. So this is what we've been doing for years now, and I'll show you the results of that the research. So they gotta use the side walls. The first thing we do is we have to trisect the tooth. So we take a high speed burr, diamond or whatever, trisect the burr, and then I use a thin diamond to go around in here. Uh, Brasilea makes an 859 surgical length burr. I go around here. I go around here, and then you take, you never take the, take this out, never put a forceps on the tooth on the left. It'll just tend to crack things and make it more difficult. Always trisect the maxillary teeth. It takes you about a minute, and, and hemisect the mandibular molars. High speed burst right to it. But look what that does. Now, look at that beautiful septum bone. That's a type A situation because you've got plenty of bone to put the implant in, and the gaps won't even matter. And here's an example of that. And you got to clean out these defects, as you see here. This case was done by Dr. Smith. He picked up this picture, and that's really nice. You can see all the, the you got the stability of the implant. Now, this is the reason why I like showing Dr. Smith's case. He was able to get a picture one week, and what a beautiful picture. All he did here was a healing abutment. And by the way, don't put a cover screw on. You want a healing abutment sitting up out of the tissue a little bit. Ideally, put a temporary on if you want, or a very flat custom healing abutment. But the key 
It, but as you always have it sticking up. Otherwise, you can get infections. If you put a cover screw on, that's where people get into trouble. You want something a, a little sticking out of the tissue so that the tissue can heal right up against it, as you're going to see here. So look at, look at one week. This is all the stuff we just spoke about. This is the new vessels coming in from the side. Now, what's this? That's the clot. See, there's no longer red. At one week, the clot is the clot is, is yellow. The clot's yellow. And the new vessels, exactly what we're showing, are coming in the granulation issue. It's not epithelialized yet. Here it is at five weeks. This is one week, and here's the five weeks. See, now you got the first layer of epithelium on there because it's, now it's able to come across as the new blood vessels from the bone come across and integrate. And that's what we want to see. Now, it's not fully keratinized yet. The turnover rate of epithelium is in the body and skin or in the mouth is 28 days. So now you got your first layer of epithelium, three to four or five weeks. Now to get that full whiteness and the thickness to get the white like orthokeratinized like this, you have to give it another 28 days to reach full maturation and keratinization. So this is what it started to look like. Here it is in one week. Here it is in five weeks. Nice. And here it is three and a half years later. I took the bridge off to just look at it and you can see the whole thing filled in. Beautiful case, well documented all the way through. One surgery, one time. But that's where the buckle plate, I mean, that's where the septum, it's a type one. But I want to show you the healing with the with the socket. Now, here's the one that we used to worry about. We can put the implant in, and now you got big gaps. You got a big gap on the palate, you got a big gap on the mesial buckle. Can this heal? The answer is yes. We don't have to do any bone graft because we're not worried about a little change in the buckle. As long as the buckle plate's there, and the powder plate of bone is there, and you get good locking into the implant, you're done. And here you see one on the mandible. Same thing. Here, this one, you hemisect, you save the septum of bone, and you put the implant in. Now, it looks funny at first. But on an x-ray, take a look at the x-ray. It looks like it's suspended in nothing. But it takes at least six months before that fills in. Here it is at one year. So it takes six months before radiographically it looks normal. But if you get good stability, that's fine. Today we go wider than this, but disengage the septum, even on the mandible. And it still comes out where you want it to be. Now, I documented this case with one of my students at school, because uh, it's a great wound healing discussion. This is a patient that obviously has neglected their mouth, but I'm wanting to see the wound healing. The nature's already trisected this root. You can see it's in bad shape. We're going to engage the apical bone. We're going to clean this out. So we use a small thin diamond, 859 surgical ink bird. We divide whatever's left, go around each root, clean it up. There's are three roots, no problem. Now look at the mineral septum. However, that gets wider apically. So don't let that get in your way because you could always go wider with an implant if you can't, if you have to. In this case, we went to about a five millimeter implant in this case, but you see we engaged the apical bone, got, got this stable. Now what's the healing here? That's what I'm showing you this case. Here it is in one week. See, there's a clot, right? Nothing, no graft, just the helium button sticking slightly up. No graft. Just to, now, here it is the same as I showed you in the previous case. Here's the clot forming, or one week, and notice the vessels are not fully in there. The, it's, the clot is now yellow. Here it is, here it is in two weeks. It's getting redder. The new granulation tissue from the bone is filling in and going up against the implant. Week three, week three, notice it's still young, but now I got the epithelium has probably got a first layer. Here it is at five weeks, starting to turn whiter, getting more keratinized. And here it is at eight weeks, now it's almost fully keratinized. And here it is at 12 weeks. So what you see here is gorgeous, you know, wound healing 101, one surgery, one time, and the patient is ready to go. Uh, you wait, wait for about three months, let the tissue mature, let the bone mature. And after about three months, you then take your impression. And this is the before and the 12 week healing. Now, what about this case? Here's a case where there was no septum of bone, infected root. I took this tooth out, as you see here. This is Heisuk. I did this case with Dr. Chu. Now, here I'm going to go to a wide genesis implant, 6.5 by 10. So we go by the width. I took the tooth out, engaged the bone apically, let this heal, put a custom, could have put a healing abutment on. Here's the two weeks, here's the three months. Look at the healing. She went away to Asia, came back in five months for the for the crown to made. You see this taking this off. Here you see the beautiful sculpted tissue just with the healing above it. One surgery, one time. She traveled all over the world, came back, and sure enough, you got beautiful tissue, and you can take your impression and make the final crown. And there's the wound healing, same same wound healing. See the see the bleeding? You see the tissue is adhered to part of it. You can see it on the metal. 
That's great. Take your impression, impression coping in. Here you see the screw down, one piece implant, gold plated, and that's fine. And there's the case intact, bone right up to the shoulder, right up to the shoulder, exactly what we like, bone filled in, good stability, platform shift, that's what we want to see. So alternatives is delayed, no flap, no graft, do not pull the flap over anything. If you have, if you, if you have, if you have no membrane, nothing. Wait three months because we're letting bone fill in, not six weeks. Like in the front of the mouth, you have apical bone. In the posterior part of the mouth, you got the sinus or the nerve. So you got to let three three months go by. That'll give you soft tissue healing and bone. And so that's what we do with the uh, if we can't get immediate placement in or part of the buccal plate's missing. So stage one surgery with or without graft for the for greater bone regeneration. If the graft primary closure is easily achieved, in other words, this is going to heal over by secondary by, by secondary healing. And in three months, you'll have soft tissue, you'll have you'll have bone in the socket to a certain degree, and if you have a dehiscence, you can have an easy easy surgery and minimal invasiveness. The worst thing you could do is try to do a graft and pull this buccal flap all the way over to the lingual to the palate. That's ten millimeters. You got to move that flap ten millimeters, and then even if you put a graft in, don't do that to your patient. If you get anything out of today, do not take a molar. Put an implant into a fresh socket and do primary closure over the top of the graft because part of the plate was missing when you like to do that. That's uncomfortable and it always opens up. Nine out of ten of them will pull open because your cheek pulls on it. That is the worst thing you can do. Take the tooth out, get rid of the infection, let the bone fill in above the nerve or underneath the sinus. Then, it, then you have a nice and the tissue fill in on top of that. You have a nice clean surgery. And if you have to graft now, you had easy closure, minimum discomfort and the case goes well. So that's what I do when I can't get an immediate in. That's the alternative. And the type C, this is a really nice case. You see the fracture line here, tooth is painful, even with it, it had to come out. Now you look at the width here. Now notice there's a septum of bone, but there's no septum of bone, but notice that you got this little indentation where the concavity was of the roots, where the, where the like a frication was. And I'll take a look at Peter. This is one of the kind of cases that I'd like to show you, just to show you what we do. We're gonna hemisect this, get rid of the crowns, it's got a huge infection, a vertical root fracture. So I'm going to take a, a high-speed dark bar, cut right through, divide it, spread it apart to come off just like you always do. Now here's the heavy section. Now what you do is you go in and you mark the, mark the buckle, mark the lingual, and then you cut right through the two. So they got room to move them mesial distally. Just don't try and take this out. Go, that's where the crack is. Go through, and what you do is go through and create a little room. As you see here, now you can move the teeth mesial to distal uh, and you try and do it. Now I wedge it mesial to distal. And then I take one out with these extended beak forceps, Salve Incorporation and other companies have it. Euphredi has them, deep grippers they're called. They grab one piece and then you wind up having, once one is comes out, then you can move the other one and take the other piece out. And once you get, take the one that seems to be the, the least amount of bone, take that one out and then move the other one into that site mesial distally. That, as you see here, and that's what we do. There's the extended tip forceps. You take one out, then we can wiggle the other. There's the crack in this tooth. And then you get the others out. And here's the important thing. Clean out the socket. You got to be careful if you're right above the nerve. Your CAT scan or x-ray should show you where the nerve is by digging too deep. But this is where you go sideways around the corners and get this granuloma to tissue out. Then you can go ahead and place an implant. Now, how wide are these implants? Now, we, six millimeters, 6.5 is Genesis, but now we have these wide bodies, the max implants uh, for years that we've been using it with great success, where the septum is gone, and our average implant, probably the most common one, is eight millimeters wide. But now, I never thought I would say this, but I, there's, they, they, come in, uh, uh, they come in different lengths, of course, also. I never thought I would say this, but you know, they come in, uh, and I'm putting implants in, and some of the second molars in particular, that are wider than they are long. Uh, I'm putting implants in that are nine millimeters wide and only seven millimeters long. It's amazing, and they work. So understand that the whole philosophy has changed. And for every millimeter you go wider, listen to this carefully, for every millimeter you go wider on any implant, go from a four to a five, how much surface area did you increase? 25%, wow. Go from a four to a six, you've increased about 50%, give or take a few points. So you can go up the ladder. When you have eight, you're making up in surface area width-wise, but that, that you don't have in the length. So there's no question that these can work. 
They have great stability and they lock into the buccolingual plates, which in the molars are thicker than the front. And also today, you know, you have the, the Tylo Max, the digital profile. So this, the company has now in, included this now, so you can take scans, uh, you know, and do this. This is a case from Mariano Pollock. I appreciate uh, him loaning me this particular slide of scanners, uh, scan abutments, and then the final case that he did. So now the company has expanded into this with different, uh, you have seven millimeter, eight millimeter, nine millimeter implants, and the different platforms as you see, 5.5, 6.5, and 7.5. So this is still got the platform shift, and this is a nice, uh, nice recent addition to the scanner buttons. And this is the case that I show you right here. Place the implant in, engage the side walls. So you don't have to you leave that area alone. You clean out the inside. And after that, you get this little indentation of bone. Then the tape will allow you to engage it. Place it right where the you know hold your hand firmly. Place it right down the central fossa. If you see it healing, there is one week. Here it is at one year. This is courtesy of Dr. Smith. You take a look, hold right down the middle, one of my partners, and that's it. Now, one of the things we did, we wanted to see the success rate and report on. So we went back and looked in our, in our cases, and we looked at the survival rate of these cases, of these implants. And we saw, it's from our private office in Manhattan. And we, we looked at this, and we did 300 implants, 33 immediates, 33 had immediate temporaries, we have type A 20, so most of the time we don't get a type A. That's maybe first molars in the maxilla. Most of the cases were type B, where you have big gaps, but you get stability from the septum. And type C, were blown out like molars, 96 of them, so about a third. But the biggest number was what? The type B, usually maxillary first molars or second molars. Engage the septum, but you got big gaps. Eight failures, and most within the first six months. 97.3% survival rate. So these are very predictable. Uh, over an 11 year period, this is what we've seen. We've done this more and more, the numbers go higher each year, not lower, because it's been so successful. But well, some of the things he saw though, when he looked at this research, when he looked at our numbers, when he was doing the evaluation, he looked at something else. He saw something then, you know, I'm looking at some of these cases, of course, looking at the X-rays and survival, and I noticed something else. I noticed that quite a few of them had decay next to the tooth. See the decay here, next to the implant even though the implant was fine. And this was something that he said, it just seems like a higher amount of, of, of uh, in, the, in the post-ops, a higher amount of decay than I would see normally in some of these older patients. And you see different cases here, where you can see that there's uh, the decay here on the second one, decay here on this one, decay here, these are all the, some of the cases with decay, decay here, decay here, and as you see, decay here. So we're worried about this decay under the crown. Now, was it just by chance or whatever? So then we started to measure this. His credit started looking at this. And he looked at, we looked at 306 sites, 424 mesial distal sites, radiographic analysis. They measured the horizontal distance from the platform to the abutment. It's the, uh, it's the interdental, intertooth distance or implant to tooth distance. And he measured the vertical distance from the platform to the contact and, and radiographic look. So this is what we measured. We measured the, the horizontal distance. We made it vertical from wherever the abutment was. We drew a vertical depth line down, and we went straight across to the crest and measured that number. That was in millimeters. And we, we tried to look, you know, and then to the contact point, but this is really the key one that we looked at. The mesial distal one is the one that was easy to look at on the radiograph and what we measured. So we all got it with the, with the top of the abutment connection to horizontally to the crest of the bone on the adjacent tooth. And what did you see? Came across something very interesting. 306 sites, 69 sites were decayed. So 22% of the implants placed were associated with decay. Wow, in molars. 63% of sites had decay. This is really interesting. Time frame seven months to 15 years. Now we need a prospective study. This was a retrospective study. We don't know when that occurred. But this is the real interesting part. And this is why we're now looking at going wider with our implants. Take a look carefully. Let me slow up here though. When the distance to the adjacent tooth was less than two millimeters, two, two to three, three to four, four millimeters or less, the percentage of, of decay over the years was, was rather, you know, what we might normally expect in an older population. But take a look when you get to four millimeters or above. Look at these numbers. 63 cases, 48 cases, 31 cases. When the distance was, was jumped from four millimeters or above to the adjacent tooth, 22%, 27%, 35%. This is an 
unbelievable number. We doubled when you get past that four millimeter mark, you double the number of, of decay. And the wider, and it was going up, the more distance was wider. Now, these were all different size implants. They were not all wide bodies. Some of them were just regular standard implants in a molar area. And that seems to be potentially something we have to look at. We're now doing the study over uh, at Columbia to look at this, and we're going to hopefully have some data. But take a look at the four millimeter mark. When you get the four millimeter distance horizontally, so make sure you understand when this distance here from the top of the implant, top of the implant, where the button connection is to the to the adjacent height of bone on the adjacent tooth. When that is four millimeters or more, uh, you wind up with a greater chance of decay, almost twice as much as if it was uh, narrower. So now if we go wider, that will make the distance less. So we, we have to learn from this. We have to learn from this, the odds ratio, look at this, 2.6, 3.2, 4.1, when you get up high versus, versus under four. So this is the distance is significantly greater. I think that's pretty clear. And so we don't have to go. So when in doubt, go wider, make a wider implant and make sure that you're closer to the adjacent one. As long as you have the buccal lingual width, go wider instead of using a narrow one. You want to go wider and also gives you a better platform, right? Gives you a much better prosthetic platform to come up instead of making a funny mushroom you got an, or a light bulb kind of thing. You come up and create a nice smooth profile off the top of the implant. How nice is that? So you get right to the contact point faster. So hopefully you appreciate that this is expedited. What we tried to bring today is aesthetics in the front. Uh, immediate placement uh, does a beautiful job of maintaining what you have. Uh, we showed you about gap distance, that it doesn't matter as long as you don't pull the flap over the gap, let it heal by secondary intention, and, and also that the graft does nothing except keep the shape of the tissue. It does something, keeps the shape of the tissue and thickens the free gingiva. Do not disturb is the key, minimally invasive surgery, and I think I've shown you that the key is to think biologically all the time. Then your clinical work becomes clearer to you and better for the patient. So I want to thank Keystone. I look forward to answering your questions now. And I want to thank Keystone and the whole group, of, you know, that is there. Uh, Malcolm Nielsen, Gisela, Lansville. I'd like to thank you all for uh, being so nice to work with and having some great products. I really appreciate working with you. So thank you very much. I look forward to now having the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the presentation uh, that we did today. Um, there's some great questions uh, that were asked. So let me go over a few of them. We'll take, uh, I'll try to get to all of them rather quickly. First one, uh, no membrane was used, only the graft. That is correct. No membrane is used, as you saw. When the buccal plate is there, there are no membranes necessary. And that's really the, the guardian rule. When the membrane, when the buckle plate's gone, that's a type two defect that wasn't discussed today, but it's in the textbook. I go to quintessence and you can look at the textbook and get hold of it. The textbook of the single tooth implant. So you can look at it there. The, Dr. Sonic Hero and myself published on that. And that's where you put a, a membrane in with the graft on the buckle, but only in the non-aesthetic zones. You don't want to do that in a high risk area with a high smile line. Then you go back and press your graft, do, do my tools, do, do the, um, a graft with a membrane inside the buckle, I call it my ice cream cone technique, then come back and do the implant in about three to four months. And then you open the flap that way. You open a flap with, with a papilla sparing incision. You know, that was what I showed you previously in a different lecture. Uh, papilla sparing incision is what I do with thinning. So no membrane was used at all. Uh, the torque minimum, uh, hand torque with the temporary, it's hand torque, so that's 10 to 15 newton centimeters. So the question came up, do you torque it all the way down? No, we want to just torque it with our hand torque. The implant goes in at usually over 20. We want 20 to 25 is the minimum Newton centimeters torque. The maximum, there is no max. That was one of the other questions. There is no max. We have implants that we put in with over 90 Newton centimeters torque that was still successful. So if the bone has a certain yield to it and it still responds. So um, we usually we get to 30 to 40 mil Newton centimeters torque and that's what we look at. Now, no, someone asked about xenograft in the, free, in the soft tissue area, the dual zone. We don't like to put xenograft into the supercrestal area in the, in, the, in the tissue zone. That's why we're using the allograft material, and that's what we prefer. And so we use the allograft material, and that way the body can get rid of it, but it still thickens the tissue. And without causing a potential um, 
uh, like little fistula on it minimizes that chance because sometimes if the tissue, if the biolysis or, or the xenograft gets caught in the free gingiva, the body can't get rid of it. And if it doesn't come out the sulcus, sometimes it comes out the buckle, and we don't like that. So we used cancellous mineralized bone. That's what we do. No xenograft, and especially super crest leaf. Um, the no, someone asked about tissue level implants. No, you don't use any tissue level implants in the front of the mouth. Posteriorly, you can, but there are no no as far as I'm concerned. And you have also an emergency profile that is given. And it's also sticking up out of the crest. So you lose too much bone because the polished collar, when you place it below the crest, will wind up with no bone on it. Remember, polished titanium will not allow bone deposition. It will allow soft tissue deposition, but no bone. So if you put a tissue level in, that's why Strauman got away from the tissue level implant and all the great teachers, Danny Boozer and so on, they all switched over to bone level implants. Why? Because they were losing bone in the front of the mouth because of the, because of the, um, the scallop bone like I showed you. And so tissue level implants are country. They're basically not, not, for the post, not for the front of the mouth, only for the back of the mouth. Maxillary cuspids, somebody asked about that. I showed you that. We do the same thing as any of the anteriors. Maxillary cuspid, lateral, central, same thing. Let's talk about antibiotics for a moment. That came up. I do one dose before, <clears throat> certainly like one dose before, one hour before. The key is to have a blood level during the actual surgery. That's true of all your surgeries. Have a blood level in the in the, in the body. And that way, when you pack the bone in, <coughs> excuse me, or do the implant, you get blood on there. The blood delivers the antibiotic. And that's the key. The blood delivers the antibiotic because the blood has the antibiotic in it. So the one major place that you want to do antibiotics is pre-op. Post-op, we usually do because we're doing a bone graft. I like to do it for one week, and then after that, that's it. And if the patient's unhealthy, that's, you know, has medical problems, diabetes, it go longer. depends on what the wound healing looks like. But one week is usually more than enough, and you get the healing that you want. So that covers the antibiotics. So the most important one, right before. And that's true of a regular standard case also without bone grafting. We're a regular healed ridge. One dose before, and unless the patient's patient medically compromised for some reason, wound healing, I just don't want to do any post-op antibiotics. And that's what the research is held up. Um, if you have a lesion, um, it's periapical area, when you clean out the defect, if the buccal crest is still there, we still put the implant down because we're going to the, to the palate. We're going to the palate root, the bicuspid, and we're going up the palate bone in the anteriors. So we don't even bother usually getting a membrane up there because we're not even close to it. We're building lingual to it, palo to it. And the bone graft goes in, but we just make sure it's cleaned out, put our finger over the little break in the bone or the, the window, the fenestration, and clean it out. And if the buccal plate's gone at the crest, then it's a type two defect, then you don't do the immediate. You wait, especially in the aesthetic zone, okay? So, so we do type twos with without periapicularis, but only uh, with membranes in the non-aesthetics area zone. Like I said, we published on that, and it's in the textbook. So, Dr. Senek here, myself, and Dr. Chu. No connective tissue. You didn't see any connective tissue graphs today. In the previous lecture, I gave you I did a ton of connective tissue graphs, big ones, little ones, but not for these immediates when the buccal plate's intact. It is unnecessary to do. We find that the dual zone grafting thickens the tissue, as I showed you, buccalingually, and it gives you that extra thickness, and that's what I'm looking for. So we do not do, and making the pouch, you see Murray, behind Murray, but the pouch makes a injury to the buccal periosteum, even if it's split thickness and it's very thin. So we don't like to open that pouch at all if we don't have to. When it works, sure, it thickens the tissue. And it's nice what you see it on the lecture circuit all the time. But this is a simple way. We're going to place a bone graft into the gap and go all the way up to the height of tissue with a small particle cancellous bone. And that seems to work out. And it gives us everything we need. So we do not need it uh, there at all. Uh, now, you do not need a bone graft in the non-aesthetic zone. Someone asked about it. the molars. You didn't see me putting any grafts in. You don't have to cover it. Just put it in the healing abutment, and the healing abutment should stick out at least one to two millimeters out of the height of the tissue. That way, the tissue can form a clot against it, and that's important. Do not just put a cover screw on. I mentioned that. Otherwise, you get uh, you know um, bacteria on that cover screw, unless it's real deep and can cause a little fistula. So we find that the best thing to do is put a healing button on, or even better yet, put on the custom healing button. It sculpts the tissue, get a beautiful response, take the time to at least make a custom healing button or a temporary totally out of occlusion. And that's the best way to do it. The loss of clot is interesting. It's just like an extraction socket, but we've actually seen less 
problems. If you don't put a temporary on, certainly the clot on a big gap, the clot could wash out, like in the other side. What's interesting about that is that the we've seen so few of these, almost none when we put a temporary on. It protects the clot with or without the graft. So we find that the temporary is really the key to this. But remember, even if you put an implant in and just put a straight healing abutment on, what do you have? You have a situation where the clot is being held in because the threads of the implant locks the clot in, plus the textured surface. So it's actually better and less chance of a clot breaking down or being dislodged when you have an implant in that gap, even if you just put a straight healing abutment on, which you know now we're trying to put temporaries on. But so the, we see fewer problems with it, and that's really good. Um, so it's different than a regular socket, and because of the threads and the texture of the implant, help hold it in. The healing abutment should be one to two millimeters out of the tissue. If the fenestrations are covered, As someone asked about CBCT scans. I think the CBCT is not mandatory, but on the anterior, without question, it makes you a better surgeon. You know where you think to see a bone is. Now we can get isolated areas. In other words, you don't have to do a whole a whole mouth. Just get the isolated regional scan. And that's what we do in our office, and most offices have that now. And that's what we try to go to because that's going to decrease the amount of radiation and also just give you the area of interest. So without question, I know where my surgery is going to go. Even if I don't make a template or a guide for a single implant, I barely make a template for me. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It's great. It's very accurate. But I find that if you have adjacent teeth, all my markers are there. And as an experienced surgeon, I don't think I need it. Am I better with one? Yes, just takes an extra visit, an extra time. And if you have it in your office, you can make a, make the, um, the template, sure. And you match it to your to your surgical guide, I mean, to your CAT scan. So that's all possible. And certainly you can do it, but, it's not, but I, I would strongly recommend, not mandatory, but strongly recommend you get a CT scan. You know where your bone is, you know the length of your implant before you start, you know the width of the implant, you know anatomic structures, and you'll be a better surgeon, I guarantee it. Talk I discussed, and a couple more things. The osteotomy for the molars, usually I, I will do the drilling to create an opening, but sometimes if it's pretty wide, I do the trial. You know, Keystone has the trial, the shape of the implant to try in before you put the implant in to see what the retention looks like and the size that you want to pick. And that's when I decide if I want to make it wider, we'll make an osteotomy, or just literally self-tap it right in, and that's what I do. So the try and duplicates are in the kit, and that's really great. Someone said, what about wider implants? It says less bone stimulation because they're wider. No, not at all. You know, bone stimulation is the same as any other implant, and it will give you stimulation to the bone. That, that, that's not a problem. The bone loss will not take place because of lack of stimulation. You have plenty of stimulation with any implant. And the last thing I want to mention, someone brought up about two centrals, two, two maxillary centrals. How do you handle that? Now, that's not my discussion today, so we're doing the single tooth. But listen carefully. The worst thing you can do, if you're going to do two centrals, have to take two centrals out, the worst thing you can do is take out the two teeth and put a flipper in. Absolutely the worst thing, because then if you lose the scallop, it flattens out, and then you're in trouble. Then you got to build up the ridge, <coughs> more surgeries, and, and to get that scallop back. Now, the good news between two centrals is that as long as you have some scallop and a little papilla, you get away with it because there's no asymmetry to the eye. It's right down the middle. It's two centrals. The worst one to put two, two implants in is a central lateral on a high smile line with normal tissue on the other side. It always looks lopsided. So that best would be with one implant in the central and build up the ridge first, make a central implant, and then cantilever and obey pontic into the lateral. So the worst thing you can do, don't don't lose that scallop. You got the scallop, put the immediates in, get ovate pontics in, and not, not two centrals, get ovate pontics in, keep the tissue shape, don't lose the papilla, and a fixed temporary is what will do that for you. No flippers, no, no, no partials, okay? So I want to thank Keystone again uh, for allowing this to take place. I hope you got a wonderful day. Hope you should have changed the way you practice. I hope we all get back to practicing soon successfully. I know in New York, we've been through quite a bit. We'll be starting our practice next week. So I look forward to seeing you and other lectures in the future. And again, thanks to Keystone and the great, great group there that I love working with. Thanks so much. Have a great, safe day and be good.